Hi, today's little quickie is all about plastic injection molding. So let's take a look at the basic principles of this process and we'll call this little quickie basic injection molding or injection molding 101. Here we have a small benchtop injection molding machine. This is a molding machine for obviously small parts and for short runs. This type of injection molding machine is often used by jewelers who use it to produce patterns that will be used for making molds for investment casting. Even though this isn't a very high production machine, it is a great machine for teaching the basic principles of injection molding and that's why we had it at school. This setup uses a thermoplastic polymer that is bought in granular form uh, and heated up and then injected at high pressure into a mold. And that gives us, well, our finished part. To make this work, well, we have to heat the polymer up to a liquid form. And for that, well, we need a heating coil and obviously an accurate heating control unit. We also have to inject that liquid polymer into the mold at a very high pressure. And for that, we have a hydro pneumatic uh, cylinder that pushes the piston into the heating core, thus injecting the plastic into the mold. This is done manually with the ram activation lever. If we're going to be injecting plastic at a high pressure, well, we're going to have to make sure that the mold stays shut. And for that, we have a pneumatic clamp. And to get the mold out afterwards, well, we have a pneumatic ejector. Both are controlled manually by this bidirectional lever. So let's see what the process looks like. Well, speaking about the molding process is great, but we haven't touched on the main attraction, and that's the mold itself. Here's the mold that we saw in the video, and it's a half mold, and that means that it opens up into two sections. But this half mold is made of four parts. So let's take a closer look at that. First thing I'd like to say is that these molds are made in aluminum. And that's important here because this uh, technique or this machine doesn't have a cooling system and that means that we're going to be injecting hot plastic into the mold and the mold needs to cool that plastic quickly if I want to cycle on to the next part. If these were as most industrial molds are in tool steels, well I'd have to have some type of cooling system if I wanted to be able to cycle the parts uh, rapidly. Another thing that I want to mention here, because I've already mentioned it quickly, is that each half mold is made of two parts and that they're screwed and doweled together. Now we can't see the dowels because they're inside there. Uh, they're made into two parts each more because it simplifies the fabrication of these cylindrical cavities that I could produce just by drilling with a regular drill bit, uh, which simplified really the fabrication. Had I made each half mold in one solid block, well, it would have been quite difficult to produce these cavities. Not impossible, but a lot more complex. So even though it would have been simpler to have a mold in just two parts, 
Well, since we simplify fabrication quite a bit, these four parts make it a lot easier. Also important to mention is that these two half molds have to align as perfectly as possible if we don't want to get massive seam lines on our final parts. And that's why we have these dowel pins and these dowel holes. And note that they're offset unequally from the edge of the mold. And that's a way of foolproofing the assembly. Because these are offset, there's only one way to assemble these two molds correctly and have the edges line up. If we zoom in on this half of the mold, well, we can see the different parts in the mold here. We have the sprue, we have the trough, we have several secondary sprues, and our cavities, the cavities that are going to produce the form or the shape of the part that we want. The sprue, well, simply brings the plastic from the nozzle of the injector into the trough. The trough is quite large. It's a lot larger than the sprue, and its objective is to redistribute that plastic to the secondary sprues. Now, if you notice, the secondary sprues are quite small. That creates a restriction. We could almost say a back pressure, and that forces really the trough to fill up completely before the uh, cavities themselves start to fill. If I didn't have the trough and I had just small sprues emanating from the original sprue, well this center part would be fully injected long before these end parts would be injected. And that, because of mold freeze, in other words the plastic not making it right to the cavity before it hardens, well, it becomes a real problem. This trough contains a large volume of plastic and maintains a high temperature of plastic. And these secondary smaller sprues really force the plastic in the trough to be distributed equally before they start filling all these cavities. And those are the main parts of an injection mold. Another thing to take into consideration with injection molding of polymers is shrinkage. And I'm not talking here about the George Costanza shrinkage type of problem. I'm really talking about dimensional problems with injected parts. Now, if your parts have to be a specific dimension, well, and I mean, all parts have to be a specific dimension. I don't know why I said that. But if they do, well, it's important that you calculate the percentage of shrinkage and produce the mold that much larger. Now, virtually all polymers have some shrinkage. Some have very, very little, and others have quite a lot. So it's important to know what the shrinkage factor is uh, for the polymer that you're going to use. Well, that doesn't answer the burning question. That is, what is this mold for? Well, this mold was part of a larger project that I had set up many years ago for a group of students at the college where I used to teach. I say set up because I didn't produce these parts. I helped with the design. Uh, I helped with uh, the setup, in other words, the planning of the project. But the parts themselves were drawn and produced by the students. So let's take a look at that project. The objective of this project was to produce uh, a brain game, a little mind teaser here, uh, uh, basically a puzzle. Uh, and that puzzle is made up of two parts. So we wanted to produce about a thousand of these puzzles. And the two parts are the base that we can see here and the peons, okay, or the, the game play parts uh, that are injected. So we had our uh, granular polymer. We produced the mold to make the trees of the peons that were cut off and that could then be placed in the base. The bases were produced six at a time, six per setup, uh, from, taken from a square sheet of plexiglass, so six bases from one small sheet. And they were done on the numerical control with this jig. Now, the, uh, the setup and the clamping 
a part of this jig has long, long since been recycled into other projects, so it's not there anymore. But I still have the base of the jig that was mounted and keyed onto the table of the numerical control mill. So we produced these bases and we produced the pins that produce the game. So I'll show you how to play the game. The objective of this game is to end up with the least amount of uh, game pieces left on the base at the end of the game. And you eliminate pieces by jumping over them with another piece. And we start the game by leaving one of the spaces empty so that we can jump over to start. So here I have an empty space. I'll pull as an example this one jump over this one, get it out and discard it because it's been jumped over. Now I can take another one, jump over that one and discard it and so on and so forth. This brain teaser and several others that I've attempted over the years have proven to me that I have an IQ just slightly higher than that of a ripe cantaloupe. And that beckons the question, why did I get into machining? I should have gone into politics. Well, that wasn't very nice. Now, actually, some politicians are quite intelligent. You know, the ones, the ones that think like I do. Well, there you go. Injection Molding 101. I told you it was a little quickie, and this time it really was a little quickie. So our next little quickie is going to be about this bad boy here because I've been getting questions about how to maintain the spindle alignment or position on a part when moving the head on these round column uh, mill and drill combos. So that will be next time. And until then, well, have fun, be safe, and happy machining. Happy machining.